So um, Diane and Peter, I have to just tell a quick story about them. They welcomed me into the chapter almost three years ago. Uh, oh. Peter made the first contact from the nomination committee and Diane um, uh, formalized the, the offer and the, uh, the uh, invitation to come in as the executive director um, almost three years ago now. And we had lunch at a little restaurant and um, I just couldn't believe the opportunity that they were offering me. I've enjoyed their friendship and their, their uh, mentorship. They both have been incredibly helpful to me and supportive of the chapter. Uh, they're amazing contributors to the chapter. They've both been on the board, uh, Diane most recently as the board president. They are beautiful, wonderful people. Um, and I love having them in my circle of friends. And um, I just want to welcome them tonight. Their, their ongoing project for the protected birds, birds of protected lands um, is really stunning. And I look forward to hearing more about it. So with no further ado, Diane and Peter, please take it away. You should have command of the uh, screen now. Okay. Okay. Well, Matthew, thank you for that very generous introduction. Um, can everybody hear me? If you can, please send a chat notice and Carolyn will pick it up. Uh, Matthew, you can hear me. If Can you nod your head? Absolutely. I can okay. hear you just fine. I'm going to turn my mic off so you won't hear background sound. Okay. Well, thanks. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, this evening, we'll be showing you photos of the avifauna of lands that have been protected by POST, the Peninsula Open Space Trust. I'll introduce the topic. Diane will do the main presentation, and then I'll wrap up with a few words at the end. Probably you already know about POST, maybe your sponsor or supporter. Over the past 45 years, POST has protected from development over 125 square miles on the peninsula and in the South Bay. It's really an astonishing achievement. The dark green spaces on the map indicate post protected lands. Almost all are in San Mateo and Santa Clara counties. The lighter green are other protected lands around the Bay Area. And those 112 orange dots that you see mark post projects. Most of them are now managed by government entities and are open to the public. Our story begins in the summer of 2020 when the COVID induced isolation gave Diane the bright idea of starting a bird photography project for post. Her concept was to create a photographic record of the avifauna on land that post has played a role in protecting. In the year and a half since then, we photographed birds on over 60 post-protected sites and created the website you see here, Birds of Protected Lands, at birds.smugmug.com. And I put that URL in the chat window. At present, the gallery holds over 2,000 photos, representing 202 species from 49 avian families. So to get on with the program, um, in the Bay Area, we're fortunate to have a wide variety of habitats and the post protected sites encompass pretty much all of them. We have freshwater ponds and lakes. At the top, you may recognize Saucel Pond on Windy Hill Open Space Preserve. In the middle is Horseshoe Lake up on Skyline Open Space Preserve. And at the bottom is a much larger clear reservoir in the South County. We have both fresh and salt water wetlands and marshes, some along the bay and others on the coast. Moving inland, the slopes of our hillsides are covered with grasslands, with oak savanna with its mix of trees and grasses, and with brushy chaparral plant communities. We have slopes and canyons covered by mixed broadleaf and conifer forests and threaded with riparian strips. Post has also worked to protect coastal headlands and beaches, including the shores of Año Nuevo, seen here with the uh, elephant seals. Driving in rural areas, 
mostly on the coast side, you come across quite a few farms and ranches with signs like this one that portray a Nueva farm. This one's located at the lower end of Tanitas Creek Road. And for me in particular, this has a, is a special favorite for cyclists because for many years, they've operated this honor system bike hut that provides food and drink for riders. These farms and ranches are part of Post Future Farmlands Initiative. In San Mateo County alone, we've lost 40% of the farmlands to development since the 1980s. And that's a trend that Post is working to reverse. So now we're ready to show you birds that are characteristic of each of these habitats, beginning with freshwater ponds and lakes. And now I'll hand the presentation over to Diane. Slide into command position here. Salzal Pond at the bottom of Windy Hill Open Space Preserve seems like a good place to start because Windy Hill was the first large conservation project undertaken by Post in 1981. Because it's only a couple of feet deep, Salzal Pond attracts dabbling ducks such as this colorful wood male duck. And one like most ducks, wood ducks nest in trees, sometimes up to a mile away from water. And in order to reach their nests, their feet are tipped with sharp claws that enable them to climb trees. Now this is a very rare adapt adaptation among, buck, du among ducks. Mallards are the most common ducks we see in post-protected lands and for good reason. These highly versatile ducks can live in nearly any wetland habitat, whether large, small, freshwater or salty, urban or rural, natural or artificial. And this adap adaptability has enabled them to span the globe. It's estimated that there are over 10 million mallard ducks in North America alone. Now mallards fly fast, clocking out at 55 miles an hour and high. In 1962, a mallard was struck by a commercial airliner at 21,000 feet, which was a record at that time for a bird aircraft collision. La Honda Creek Open Space Preserve is a relatively new OSP located above the town of La Honda. We photographed this greater, or is it a lesser, yellow legs foraging along the edge of the pond there, looking for small invertebrates and crustaceans. Now, like many late onset birders, as we describe ourselves, we still struggle to differentiate the lesser from the greater yellow legs. When both appear together, it's easy. When seen alone, not so easy. One expert I consulted said identifying this bird has given birders fits ever since there have been birders, and I agree. Song sparrows are one of the most widespread songbirds in North America with 52 named subspecies breeding from Alaska, east to Newfoundland, and south to Mexico. But wherever they breed, they prefer nesting in reeds and grasses near water. Now notice a band around this bird's right leg. It told us that the sparrow had been banded a year earlier at Sears Hill Lake in Stanford's Jasper Ridge Biological Preserve. So between the banding and our sighting at Salsa Pond a year later, it had migrated all of three miles. We found this wintering ringneck duck at Horseshoe Lake in the Skyline Ridge Open Space Preserve. This preserve is one of several OSPs lining Skyline Boulevard between Highway 92 and Highway 17, and we've been trying to visit them all. You may have noticed by now that the dark brown ring around the duck's neck is barely visible. And yet the ring around the end of its bill is quite prominent. And why they named this bird after its least visible field mark has always puzzled us. The largest freshwater lake we visited was Calero Reservoir, Calero County Park. Now nestled in the eastern foothills of the Santa Cruz Mountain, this park covers 4,500 acres of quite varied habitats. It was here that we finally photographed our first member of the rail family, the to us elusive Sora. Now, when I search for rails, we've learned that they are often heard, like the black rail that Matthew heard a few days ago, then seen. The Sora attracted our attention with a loud call that sounded like a horse whinnying. So we spent the next hour waiting for this bird to come out into the open. Once it did, though, we thought it was well worth the wait. Both Western and Clark's Greaves spend the winter at Calero Reservoir. If you want to go, look for them down at the uh, end of the lake near the dam. Greaves spend virtually all of their lives in water, even building floating nests so they do not have to walk on land to breed. 
During mating season, the males engage in a ritual called rushing. They stand up in the water and literally walk across it in short stutter steps. And we've seen this a few times at Calero, but it happens so fast we've never been able to catch the rush on camera. We're still working on it. Wetlands are interesting any time of year, but particularly in winter when they host countless wintering waterfowl, and we're lucky to live near so many of them. Among our favorite winter migrants are the northern pintails at frequent Bear Island. They are the largest and, to our eyes, the most elegant of the North American dabbling ducks. This part of Don Edwards' wildlife refuge is made up of three islands that were once used for salt production. In the early 1980s, Leslie Salt, had decided to, Leslie salt Company decided to develop this land into a large housing estate. And when the company's plan was approved by Redwood City, a small but very determined group of local citizens protested by placing a referendum opposing the project on the ballot. It passed by a mere 44 votes. After that, Post immediately recognized that Bear Island was one of the last restorable wetlands in the Bay Area and started raising a fundraising campaign to purchase it. With help from 5,500 donors, the land was purchased in 1997 and after 14 years of restoration work, finally opened to the public. And if you've not been there, I urge you to go now while the wetlands are full of wildlife. A willet, such as this one we saw on Bear Island, looks rather plain until it opens its wings, displaying its broad black and white wing bars. Male willets invest a lot of time in their offspring, spending just as much time incubating eggs as the females do. She sits on the nest by day while he takes the night shift. Now this division of labor works because willows can forage by day and night. And while they can't see it all that well in the dark, they use their sensitive beaks to kind of poke and feel in the sand for prey. And it works. Wetlands also attract insects and the birds that hunt them. So one day on Bear Island, we came across this pair of barn swallows with the adult feeding a chick that seemed almost as big as its parent. According to a recent article I saw in The New Scientist, Earth is home to around 50 billion wild birds, but only four species number at a billion plus individuals. These four most populous species are in order house sparrows, European starlings, ring-billed gulls, a surprise, and barn swallows. So moving south from Bear Island, Ravenswood Open Space Preserve is a smaller saltwater marsh located in East Palo Alto. Peter and I, we visited this marsh twice during King Tides, hoping to see Ridgeway rails wading out the flood on the boardwalks. No such luck, but we did encounter this ring-billed gull, the third most common global bird, with a rodent in its beak. Continuing south along the bay, the Stevens Creek Shoreline Nature Area is a tidal marshland loaded, uh, located beside Mountain View Shoreline Park. Post described this marsh as a birder's paradise, and so it was for us when we spotted this bald eagle perched offshore. Take a close look at the eagle's feet, at those long, curved, razor-sharp talons. Now these talons earned eagles the name raptor, which comes from the Latin rapere, meaning to grip or to grasp. A bald eagle's grip is said to be about 10 times stronger than that of an adult human's hand. So once an eagle swoops down to grasp its prey, its talons lock on and can't be unlocked until the bird reaches land and lets go. On an Alaskan cruise years ago, we saw a bald eagle that had caught a salmon too heavy for it to lift out of the water. And for the next hour, we watched this bird use its wings to swim about a mile back to shore. Only then could it release the bird. And had it not been able to swim to land, that eagle would have been pulled underwater by the salmon and drowned. The biggest show of winter waterfowl is post-protected land is found in the section of Don Edwards at the southern end of the bay. Created as the nation's first urban wildlife refuge in 1972, Don Edwards has expanded over the years to protect more than 30,000 acres along our, along our bay. The green-winged teal, the smallest of North America's dabbing ducks, is a common winter visitor, and its bill is lined with comb-like spikes that help the teal filter tiny invertebrates from the water as it forages. It's also really darn cute. Large flocks of American white pelicans winter at Don Edwards, and unlike the brown pelicans who dive for fish, they feed while swimming and dipping their bills in the water. 
White pelicans forage almost exclusively by day here on their wintering grounds where we see them. But during the breeding season, they always also forage at night. Because even though it's harder to see then, they catch larger fish in the dark. And this matters because adult pelicans need to catch 150 pounds of fish to raise one chick from birth until they can forage on its own. We hear the grunting calls of Virginia rails often at Don Edwards, but we seldom see one. Some argue that the expression thin as a rail was inspired by this secretive bird family. And I'm not sure that's true, but this bird is adapted to life among the reeds in several ways. Its backbone, for example, is highly flexible, enabling it to slip easily through this most impenetrable reed bed. And notice the dark feathers on its forehead. They are adapted to withstand the wear and tear that comes from pushing through the reeds. This rig-decked phalarope was a here-again, gone-again bird that gave us a merry chase last fall. We reported report sightings of rails, or excuse me, of foul ropes late in the day, only to hustle out the next morning and find them gone. Now these birds are not exactly rare, but they often migrate offshore, only occasionally pausing at wetlands where we might see them. We finally found a small flock feeding at the Don Edwards New Chicago Marsh. And this fail rope must have found something good to eat there because its tongue is still hanging out. The Wilson snipe is another bird that is not so much rare as elusive. It blends in so perfectly with the shoreline vegetation that it's almost impossible to see unless you practically step on it. And when you do, it is up and gone in a flash. And that may explain why 19th century sharpshooters who successfully hunted this shorebird were nicknamed snipers. Unlike the snipe, this ruff we found at Don Edwards last spring is a true rarity. Our only other sighting of ruffs was in northern Norway, where we saw several gathered at a frigid lek. German birders who stopped by to watch the show called them Kriegflugel, which translated as bird that makes war. Now, having watched the male ruffs charging at each other in mock battles, hoping to impress the watching females, we thought the name quite apt. Pescadero Marsh is the only extensive wetland on the coast side of the San Francisco, San Francisco Peninsula. This 235-acre preserve includes tidal estuary as well as both fresh and saltwater marshes. The tidal estuary attracts shorebirds like this long-billed curdew with this incredible 8-inch long beak. Now imagine trying to eat, sleep, bathe, fly, and mate with such a long appendage attached to your face. But for curlews, their long bills allow them to reach burrows of shrimp and crabs hidden deep in the mudflats. And to make this searching easier, the tip of their bill is controlled by separate muscles so it can act like fingers probing for food. Pescadero's marshes attract squadrons of ducks, the occasional brant, and last winter four juvenile tundra swans. Now these young birds were born in northern Alaska and flew more than 4,000 miles from the breeding ground to winter in California. Laguna Seca, which Carolyn was talking about earlier and translates as dry lake, is a vernal pool located in northern Coyote Valley. Vernal pools are seasonal wetlands that form in shallow depressions that fill with rainwater during the winter. And as the days warm, the water gradually evaporates, turning depressions into meadows. When we first visited Laguna Seca last winter, it was a pond teeming with waterfowl, including this American avocet in full breeding plumage. But when we returned this fall, the meadow had replaced the pond and was being grazed by a large flock of Canada geese and a smaller contingent of these greater white-fronted geese. So wet or dry, Laguna Seca attracts waterfowl. If you birded in our hills, you've wandered through each of these sunny habitats. So let's start with grasslands, which are often grazed by cattle. We saw this bird singing on a post at Coyote Ridge Open Space Preserve. Located in the foothills of the Diablo Range, this OSP attracts songbirds foraging for seeds and insects, including western meadowlarks. For most of the year, the meadowlarks stay deeply hidden in the tall grass, but come spring, the males pop out into the open, singing to attract a mate. Coyote is not yet open to the public, but can be visited on docent-led walks. 
The most popular time for tours is April, when these hillsides are captured or carpeted with wildflowers. To observe a spot, contact the Sala Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority. And I've heard that there's a big rush in April, so better get your reservations soon. The Sais Phoebe is a winter visitor to Bay Area grasslands. We often see them on fences and bushes surveying the land below for insects. These birds have been fly catching in the western half of the United States for a very long time. Paleontologists have found Sais Phoebe fossils in Arizona, California, New Mexico, and Texas dating back over 400,000 years. Cowell Ranch State Beak, located just south of Half Moon Bay, was unknown to us until we started our post project, but now is one of our favorite stops. White-tailed kites are commonly seen there, hunting for voles, mice, and rats in the open fields. We're not sure just which of these small rodents this kite had in its claws when it landed on a nearby fence post, but it seemed happy with whatever it was. We found this grasshopper sparrow stinging for a male last spring at the Lahan. The creek open space preserve. As its name suggests, a grasshopper sparrow sings a high, buzzy pitched insect like song. Now, grasshopper sparrows have a well earned reputation for being hard to find. When we're not out singing like this one, they stay hidden in the grass, running around on the ground like mice. Shifting to the oak, so oak savanna, this acorn woodpecker is the iconic bird of this habitat. We heard that everywhere when we were birding Long Ridge, another of the post-protected OSPs strung along Skyline Boulevard. And despite being named for their acorn collecting, these woodpeckers get most of their food by fly catching for insects. And unlike our always available woodpeckers, all excited fly catchers are shorter visitors to our local woodlands. These twice a year fly catchers pass through California en route to and from their summer breeding grounds in Alaska and the winter wintering grounds in the Andes Mountain. So this is the longest migration undertaken by any North American flycatcher. They're really handsome. With its mix of trees and grassy meadows, oak savanna is a perfect habitat for great horned owls, but we never see them. They silently hunt the fields by night and then roost hidden trees by day. But lucky for those of us living at the Forum, where Peter and I are now residents, we've had a pair of great horned owls nesting near us in Rancho San Antonio open space for years. So watching their nesting site last spring, we saw nothing more than two tufts of feathers and a pair of golden eyes for weeks. But our persistence was rewarded when a little white puffball began to peer out as well. And a few weeks later, the mother owl emerged from the nest with her newly fledged chicks. The great horned owls live 10 to 15 years in the wild, so we are hoping for a repeat nesting next year. This bird is the rarest in our gallery. It caught our attention while we were hiking in the Montebello Open Space Preserve on Page Mill Road. It's so unusual we thought you'd like to see two reviews of it. We knew at first glance it was something unusual, but looking at our photographs, we were stumped. Identifying this bird was way above our pay grade. So we appealed to our friend Brian Sullivan of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Now, in addition to being the head of the eBird project in the past, Brian is the lab's foremost expert on North American raptors. After much pondering and Peter sending him close-ups of various features, Brian came up with this ID. Our mystery raptor is a rare red-tailed hawk, rough-legged hawk hybrid. Not only that, but according to Brian, our hawk is the only second documented occurrence of this hybrid. Pretty cool. Chaparral, or chaparral habitats look dry and inviting to many of us, but they are home to a surprising variety of birds. California scrub jays are probably the smartest. The brain to body mass ratio of an adult scrub jay is said to rival that of chimpanzees and dolphins. California quail have to be the handsomest chaparral bird, at least in my opinion. So you've probably observed when quail are disturbed, they are more likely to run than to fly from danger. With their short, powerful legs, they can achieve ground speeds of up to 12 miles per hour. Now, in contrast, the average human's running speed is more like eight miles per hour. Oh, and that teardrop plume on the male's head is made of six gracefully curving feathers. So cute. 
This male lazuli bunty may be the most colorful chaparral bird. We found this one singing in golden sunlight at the Russian Ridge Open Space Preserve. Now, just as we recognize people by their voices, the lazuli bunting seem to do the same thing. Young males copy the tunes of older nearby males, thereby creating a kind of song neighborhood in which they all sound similar. Now, males from the same songs neighborhood tolerate and recognize and tolerate each other, but they respond aggressively to buntings from outside the neighborhood who are singing unfamiliar songs. White crowned sparrows may be the friendliest chaparral bird because they venture into our yard to feed and seem happy to have us stop and admire their singing. We were serenaded by this white crowned sparrow while visiting Rancho Corral de Tierra, a newish preserve overlooking Moss Beach. This recent addition to the Golden Gate National Recreation Area is best described as a work in progress. Finding it? Not easy. Its entrance is off a small neighborhood street in Moss Beach. Parking? Uh, not young, none yet, but they're working on it. Public access? Well, down a long dirt road and then crossing through a large equestrian center. But once you find it, you will be rewarded by great views of the sea below. The American goldfinch may be the latest nesting chaparral bird. Now check out this bird's crisp yellow, black, and white plumage. The American goldfish is the only member of the finch family that molts twice a year, in both fall and spring. But growing a fresh set of feathers each spring takes a lot of food and energy. And so the goldfish waits until midsummer foods like thistle seeds and nesting material like thistle down are readily available to finally build a nest. The rock wren is hands down the best chaparral singer. The male has a repertoire of a hundred songs or more. Rock wrens live on high, dry, rocky slopes. They can survive there happily because they do not need access to water. Instead, they get whatever moisture they need from their food. The Anna's hummingbird is the smallest chaparral bird. We saw this female Anna's feeding on bristles high in the Sierra Azul Open Space Preserve a large preserve that stretches from the Lexington Reservoir to the top of Mount Hummahum. Notice the yellow pollen on its beak. Now, I used to think of Annas as local yardbirds, but we now know they are chaparral species whose habitat once stretched from the Baja Peninsula to Southern California. Today, however, the Annas range has expanded as far as north as British Columbia and as far east as Texas. And that's because of us. Anna's hummingbirds now colonize, new now colonize new locations, even cold ones, based on housing density and the availability of flower, gardens, and nectar feeders. I read in a recent issue of Living Bird that black caps, a common warbler in Europe, were changing their winter migration pattern by flying north to the British Isles rather than south to Africa. And the reason is much the same as the Anna's expansion. Around half of all British households feed birds. The black caps that fly north have discovered that backyard bird, backyard bird feeders provide a more reliable food supply with less moving around than their traditional African wintering grounds. Woolden areas, as you well know, are beautiful to walk in, but oh, they are a challenging place to see and photograph birds. Many forest birds are more heard than seen, and this is true of the Stellar's jays. They generally stick to the tall upper branches of trees, waiting to scold us human beings as we walk by with their harsh cries. They also are proficient mimics, often fooling us with calls that sound like red-tailed or red-shouldered hawks. Are, do, are they doing this to warn us? I don't know. Scare us away. Wish we knew. Far below the jays, tiny ruby-crowned kingas scurry about the trees, gleaning the twigs and leaves for insects. Weighing at just half an ounce, kicklets are the energizer bunnies of the bird world. They just never seem to stop, especially when you're trying to photograph them. And despite their frenetic pace, they are said to run on just 10 calories a day. The Pileated is North America's largest woodpecker, and its curious name comes from the Latin Pileatus, meaning capped or crested. And if lucky, you might see a Pileated woodpecker hammering away at a dying tree or log. It's most likely searching for its favorite food, carpenter ants. 
When found, the woodpecker uses its barbed tongue to gather up any ants, ant larvae, and other bugs hiding beneath the bark. We've included these two photos of the same brown creeper just to show how hard they are to see unless you are lucky enough to catch a glimpse of one in profile. These birds are very methodical foragers. They prefer large live trees with deeply furrowed bark because such trees harbor the densest quantities of species. The creepers glean the trunk with their long down curved bills starting near the bottom and spiraling their way up to the top. Then they fly to the bottom of another large tree to begin again. Like other members of the thrush family, the hermit thrush forages on the ground, hopping and scraping through leaf litter in search of insects. The haunting song of the hermit thrush inspired Walt Whitman to include this bird in Where Lilacs Last in the Dooryard Bloomed. Whitman wrote this poem as an elegy to Abraham Lincoln shortly after the president's assassination. I'll read you just the relevant stanza. In the swamp, in secluded recesses, a shy and hidden bird is warbling a song. Solitary the thrush, the hermit, withdrawn to itself, avoiding the settlements, sings by himself a song, song of the bleeding throat. Wherever there are creeks and streams, you can lay odds that there is a common yellow throat nearby. Because these warblers nest close to the ground, their chicks are highly vulnerable to predation. And so to foil potential predators, the adult yellow throats sneak food to their chicks by dropping into the dense vegetation away from the nest, sneaking through the undergrowth to feed their chicks, and then leaving by another route. In winter, yellow-rumped warblers can often be found along creeks, darting out over the water to catch insects. Now, given that this warbler has a yellow head, a yellow throat, and yellow flanks, we've always thought it odd that it was named for its rump. This dainty, downy woodpecker, the smallest North American woodpecker, prefers foraging in riparian areas. We saw this one near the creek running through the Thornwood Open Space Preserve. An adult downy weighs in at just three quarters of an ounce. And yet, as this one proved us, to us, it is strong enough to strip bark from trees. The hairy woodpecker looks like a downy on steroids. And yet, for all their similarities, the downy and the hairy are only distantly related, which raises the question of why they have evolved to look so similar. Using data from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology's Feed Watch project, a scientist at the lab noticed that when a downy is at a feeder, it will give way to the larger hairy woodpecker. But the downy will stand its ground and drive on birds twice its size, such as a beefy northern cardinal. This led him to propose what he calls the downy woodpecker innocent bystander trickery hypothesis. The idea is that by evolving to look like the larger hairy woodpecker, the tiny downy is able to trick larger birds into leaving it alone when feeding. The highway between San Francisco and Santa Cruz is dotted with headlands and beaches, many of which have been preserved for public use with the help from post. The coastal headlands are also varied in terms of habitats, but whether grasslands, scrublands, or woodlands, they are all raptor magnets. We often see northern harriers coursing low over fields, looking and listening for any movement. And despite being hawks, harriers have short owlish faces with their eyes set in owl-like circular discs. And unlike most hawks, again, harriers use their hearing as much or more than their eyesight to locate their prey. This gray blue heron posed for us on the cliffs above San Gregorio Beach. When we lived in Menlo Park, we also saw these harriers in nearby fields. And curious as to why, I sat down on a log and watched one poised over a ground squirrel's hole. It stood there motionless for nearly half an hour, so it seemed to me. But patience was rewarded when a ground squirrel poked his head up and it was instantly speared by the heron. The bird then swallowed the squirrel head first and whole. Watching that squirrel slowly move down the bird's neck was akin to watching the proverbial pig in a python. Townsend's warblers pass through the headlands each fall en route to their wintering grounds in Mexico. 
They fly mostly at night, stopping at places like Pillar Point Bluff to rest and refuel during the day. Now, once the Townsends reach Mexico, they feed extensively on honeydew, a sugary fluid excreted by plant-sucking insects like aphids. This honeydew is such a favorite food with the Townsends that some of them will set up and defend territories around these birds, especially the ones that are heavily infested. Yet even with this sugar high, the Townsends warbler weighs in at less than half an ounce. The common raven, in contrast, tips the scales at more than two and a half pounds. And despite its weight, the raven is an acrobatic flyer, often doing barrel rolls and somersaults in the air. One raven was even seen flying upside down for more than half a mile. Now we've heard of crows and ravens stealing eggs from other birds' nests, but this was the first time we had seen such a theft in progress. When we first saw this peregrine falcon, falcon perched on the high cliff of Banano Nuevo Beach, we wondered why. And then we noticed these bank swallow holes on the cliffs with birds flying in and out. Soon the falcon was dive bombing the swallows, creating panic among the gulls gathered on the beach below. It was quite a sight. The only member of the ocean going alcid family that we have managed to photograph is a pigeon guillemot. And that may be because we can recognize this alcid by its bright red feet. Like the wood deck, the guillemot has mm. claws on its toes, so instead of using them to climb trees, the guillemot uses them to climb and cling to nearly vertical rocks. Today, squadrons of brown pelicans are a common sight along the coast. We often see them plunging into the waves for fish. But in the years after World War II, the widespread use of the pesticide DTC brought them almost to the brink of extinction. Once DTT entered the food chain, it altered the ability of pelicans, as well as other large and long-lived birds, like raptors, to metabolize calcium. As a result, their eggshells became too fragile to survive being incubated. The banning of DTT in 1972 came just in time to save these prehistoric looking birds. Like the brown pelican, the elegant tern also forages from the air, dropping like a guided missile when it spots a fish. The fate of both these species depends on the anchovy supply. When anchovies are abundant, they have high breeding success. But when the anchovy population crashes, as it did from 19, 2009 to 2015, both species abandon their nests for lack of food. At the same time, up and down the coast, sea lion pups starve by the thousands. We came across surf birds gathered on rocky islands that line Beach Hollow State Beach. The surf birds winter range is among the longest and narrowest of any North American breeding bird. In winter, they can be found from the North America on from northern Alaska, excuse me, northern Alaska to Tierra to Tierra, oh, I'm getting tired. Northern Alaska to Tierra del Fuego. Now that's a range of nearly 11,000 miles in length. In width, however, the surf bird's winter range extends inland only a few miles above the tide line. Our last shorebird, with its neon red bill and bright yellow eye, is a hard to miss black oyster catcher. When researching the oyster catcher, I learned that it eats pretty much anything it can find. Mussels, limpets, whelks, urchins, crabs, marine worms, worms and beetle larvae, but nary a mention of oysters yet another avian mystery. At last count, Post has protected close to 30 farms and ranches. Some are owned by Post and operated by tenants. Others are privately owned but protected by conservation easements that limit the future use of the land to agriculture, open space, no matter who holds the title in the future. We have birded on just a few of these properties and only with permission from the owners or operators. Blue House Farm in San Gregorio is open to the public and welcomes visitors to its farmer's market and you pick strawberry patches. When we visited, huge flocks of blackbirds were gleaning the fields. And Peter got this male brewers in perfect light as it posed for us on a fence post. We came across our first bagpies just two weeks ago on a post protected outing to Tilton Ranch. The purchase of this large working farm in 2020 preserved a critical pathway for animals in the Santa Cruz Mountains to reach the Diablo Range to the east and the Gabalon Range to the south. The details of this purchase illustrate how Post works in concert with other partners to preserve key habitats. 
the $18 million price tag was funded by no less than eight entities. Post, the California Wildlife Conservation Board, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Santa Clara Valley Habitat Agency, the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority, the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, and Santa Clara Parks and Reputation, uh, excuse me, Santa Clara Parks and Recreation. Currently, the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority is exploring ideas for the future use of this property and would really welcome your input. The last and perhaps the most familiar bird in our presentation is this California toy, which we photographed at the Andriotti Farmland Farms farm stand in Half Moon Bay. Seen foraging on the ground, this largest of the sparrows looks just like another plain brown bird, but in this pose, showing off his handsome collar and crest and flashing his orange eye ring, it looks anything but plain. So it's a good reminder that there is beauty to be found in every bird, no matter how dull or drab it might appear at first sight. One just has to take the time to look for it. And with that, I'll return you back to Peter, who photographed all these birds we've shared with you this evening. Well, um, I often get questions about the photography side of things, so I thought I'd say a few words about that. These days I'm using this Canon R5 full-frame mirrorless camera. The coolest thing about this camera is what Canon calls AI-based animal eye tracking. And when it comes to photographing birds in flight, it's almost magical. All I have to do is keep the bird in the field of view and the camera does the rest. It finds the bird, focuses on it, tracks the bird as it flies, and maintains autofocus as it does. The net result is I get a lot more keepers than I did using the previous generation of technology. I most often pair the camera with this 400 millimeter f4 lens. Um, that's the biggest piece of glass that I'm happy to carry around in the field all day and shoot handheld with no tripod required. Field work is only half the fun. For every hour in the field, I spend about an hour or so curating and post-processing the photos using an Adobe product called Lightroom. Curating means throwing out about 80 or 90% of the photos and IDing the keepers. Now here's a typical example of post-processing. We have a strongly backlit, backlit subject, which is very common in flight photos. The original digital image, it's called the raw image, contains much more information than the JPEG image that's displayed. But the information is there, and in Lightroom we can use it to lighten the bird and bring out the plumage with that at the same time turning the sky from blue to bright white. So to wrap up, uh, we hope you've enjoyed our tour of Birds of Protected Lands. All the photos that Diane showed you can be found at birds.smugmug.com, the website that I described at the outset. If you choose to visit, you'll find the birds arranged as they are in your field guide, taxonomically by family and then by species. You can click through from family to species to thumbnails, to full-size images. Once on a full-size image, you can use the arrow keys or icons to page through the photos of that species. The photos are labeled with both species and location, so you can type, say, song sparrow into the search box and find all the photos of that species. Or you can type, say, mallard slough and find all the photos taken at Don Edwards Mallard Slough. And one last word, the legal fine print says that anyone is free to use the photos for any non-commercial purpose, provided only that credit is given to me as the photographer. So that concludes our presentation. Thank you again for joining us. And now perhaps there's time for some questions or comments. Yeah. Um...